Good afternoon. I hope you're all seeing my screen okay. I think it looks like you are. Well, good afternoon. My name is Alenka Quintrell. I'm one of the clinical education team members at Genova Diagnostics. I am also a nutritional therapist, so I see my own clients as well. So I'm, and I actually specialize quite a lot in cardiovascular conditions. So I'm really actually looking forward to today's session to talk about heart health and all the matters of the heart. So please, if there are any issues with hearing me or if you're not seeing my slide if someone could just like write a little note in the chat box or the question box just to quickly let me know that would be amazing otherwise i'm going to crack on i think i'm going to i'm going to take that as everything's okay all right well uh thank you so much for joining us today because obviously appreciate it's always a, a chaotic time of year especially and it takes a long time a lot of time to take time out to do these sorts of things so i'm really thankful for you all for joining and it is going to be an hour-long session today so it might be a little bit longer we're going to just see how much we get through um but by all means it's getting recorded so if you have to jump off for whatever reason um totally understand you can always come back to it another time and any questions, if you have any as we go through, if you could just drop them in the question box as well, and we'll answer them at the end. And anything I don't get round to, I promise I will send you an answer in an email form. So I wanted to focus on heart health today. Obviously, we do have a cardio check panel to go through, so uh, it's all very exciting. But it's also such a prevalent condition, and I feel like it's often maybe not talked about enough. Maybe that's just my opinion, but it is the leading cause of death globally, like literally around the world, most people are dying from heart disease and anything else. So it's a massive area of concern. And I'm pretty sure for that reason, we all know someone who's been, you know, uh, supported with either cardiovascular medications, they've been given a diagnosis, maybe they've actually had some sort of uh, stroke or heart attack or something like that. So hopefully today's session makes you know the sort of reasons behind those things happening a bit clearer and uh yeah i'm excited let's just let's just get started shall we so oh yeah all right let's jump into the objective so what we're all, what we're all here for today is to generally just gain a better understanding about heart health markers you know the why's about testing because especially for cardiovascular conditions it's definitely essential to test so understanding sort of the key markers the choice of those markers behind this test and then also uh, i really want to focus a bit on cholesterol i totally appreciate it's this very complicated area that we don't really know too much about um and so i want to explore that in a bit more depth and generally give you the whole <laughs> sort of uh, portion of it that it's not the whole picture so uh, it's a huge screening process for cardiovascular disease, um, but it's actually not telling us enough as just its own isolated section. So we'll look at it as a bigger picture thing. And then obviously I want to show you the cardio check panel. So we'll look into um, what it looks like and when you'd use it, etc. So to start with, the cardio check, it's, uh, it is a blood test. So it does require a blood draw, and it's generally a risk assessment test for cardiovascular disease. And we sort of have three sections. We look into lipids, so that obviously is a huge area of cholesterol. We then look into the cardiometabolic markers, which is assessing um, mainly inflammatory markers. And then we also have a hormonal insight as well. So there are uh, specific hormones that can obviously impact our heart health. And for this panel, we look into testosterone and sex hormones and binding globulin. So the whys behind choosing the test is generally we're looking at a deeper dive into cardiovascular disease and also the risk factors. So we obviously want to evaluate the risk factors. It's um, a very much a silent disease for quite a long time. Uh, it's also a chronic condition. So it's insidious in its onset. So it starts very, very slowly and obviously builds gradually. And we see that progression as we age. So this is a great reason to test. Uh, because we want to identify those risk factors much earlier on if we can. And if anything, we want to identify the root cause of them in the first place. So going for a test where it's more comprehensive is certainly going to be 
um, a great benefit in those areas. Then we can work on prevention, hopefully, you know, even repairing damage if needs be. And generally, you know, early detection of risk factors is the best. So that gives us a, a bigger area to work with in terms of seeing a difference. So yeah, catching things earlier is always the best option. And who is it for? Pretty much anyone who's interested in seeing how their heart's functioning, especially if they already have any sort of symptoms, goes without saying, obviously if they're on medications already, if they um, are experiencing any sort of common cardio symptoms like palpitations, chest pains, uh, maybe they've got swollen ankles, edema, things like that. If they have a risk of cardiovascular disease in their family as well, maybe they have a genetic uh, sort of predisposition. Um, and then generally, you know, if they have a poor nutrient diet, so if they're just not eating particularly well, maybe they're on a very, very westernized diet uh, and you just suspect, okay, this is probably gonna be having a negative effect on your heart health, let's explore that. And in all honesty, anyone who's interested in living longer, so if you're um, sort of in the field of working with longevity or you know, have clients who want to stay younger forever, then you absolutely have to address heart health. It's uh, the quickest way of aging um, if we have any damage to our heart or blood vessel or circulatory system in general. So um, it, it would always be at the top of my um, sort of testing options if someone came to me for longevity support. Um, and I have put a little section here for optional accompaniments. So there aren't currently any, any add-on options for this test. Um, so I've just jotted down a few options that you could consider doing alongside a cardio check um, or you know, maybe a little bit later on. So we do know cardio, uh, cardiovascular disease, it's, it's, um, it's synonymous with inflammation. So checking someone's inflammatory profile is always gonna be a nice thing to have, like an essential fatty acid profile, so we can identify the types of fats they are consuming, um, as well as, you know, have they got enough of the anti-inflammatory fats, like omega-3s. So that's a really nice option. You could also consider something like a stool test, like a GI effects. Um, in terms of identifying further inflammation, maybe it's coming from the gut, maybe there are endotoxins coming from the gut, etc. We have the metabolomics, so looking at metabolic health, especially if you've got anyone with, um, you know, currently with metabolic disease, or maybe they have issues with blood glucose regulation, things like that. And then of course the adrenal stress profile. So stress is a massive um, driver of cardiovascular symptoms and cardiovascular disease. So um, addressing someone's stress profile, it, it, it would be amazing as well. So let's move on to the actual cardio check itself. So this is what it looks like. It's a really nice clean report. It's just one page and it is a blood test so it does require uh, centrifuging in this case because we've got the lovely homocysteine included and it, so it is a little bit of a hassle in terms of obviously getting a sample done i appreciate but the bang for buck you're going to get is phenomenal so um i'd really you know put that to the side because actually we want to identify someone's cholesterol, of course, which we'll go into depth, of course, in this session, but we need to see what it actually looks like against some other key markers like inflammation in particular. And it's that combination that, that's really worth doing. So we do break it into these three key sections. We have lipids, uh, obviously the breakdown of cholesterol, et cetera. We then have the cardiometabolic markers, so um, HSCRP, homocysteine, insulin, and then the sex hormone markers, so testosterone, sex hormone binding globulin. I want to just touch on the reference range. Um, the green and yellow that you can see is is the reference range combined. So that is, it can be high or low within the reference range if it's in yellow. Anything then in the green section is solid, you know, you're actually at a really nice optimal zone. And then anything red, high or low is obviously outside the reference range, high or low, and definitely a priority that we wanna work on, uh, you know, squashing that back into the main zone. Certain markers you'll see, don't have a low end or maybe don't have a really high end as a negative. So that totally just depends on what the marker is. For instance, things like triglycerides, we actually only ever want those to be low. So actually having anything above that is then considered a negative. Um, anyway, we'll talk about that a bit more as we go through. So just to touch on cardiovascular disease, because it is so prevalent and uh, in all honesty, you know, the heart is a pump essentially. So it pumps 
um, a huge amount of blood. It's like 7,600 liters of blood around our body every single day. And it's um, obviously, it controls our heart rates, uh, it controls our, um, our pulses, everything like that. So it beats like 100,000 times a day as well. Uh, and it constantly will adapt to whatever demand we put in place. So that in itself is a huge task, which obviously goes unnoticed. We don't ever really think about it until something goes wrong. And if there is any disruption to that flow, so um, that can be impacting the blood flow to the heart, to the brain, um, to the body, that is classified as cardiovascular disease. And there are loads of different types, which I've listed a few of them, but obviously there are loads more. And coronary heart disease is probably the most prevalent in the UK, um, certainly worldwide as well. Um, it also is the most common one where you'll have a heart attack. So really, really essential that we understand it in a bit more depth. And it's definitely worth just exploring heart function, in my opinion, a lot earlier. So we might not see symptoms for a while, but there's always little, um, just sort of little warnings that we can maybe be a bit more aware of. So I've just jotted a few of them down, like just general considerations for if a client comes in, you know, and they've got like extreme stress load, or maybe it's just been a chronic stress, um, you know, huge amounts of trauma, et cetera. That for me is a bit of a warning signal to let's really look at your heart health to see what, what might be going on or the impact that that might have had. Um, if someone's had toxin exposure, we're gonna come on to that in a bit more depth because that's massive in terms of cardiovascular disease. Um, naturally, if someone's overweight or obese, or they've got dysglycemia, even as far as type 2 diabetes, you know, all of those, we know they are uh, hugely correlated with cardiovascular disease. Um, but other symptoms like palpitations, maybe they just get sort of like that heart fluttering, um, cold extremities, which is a key sign of a circulatory issue, chest pains, obviously if someone's fainting, so anything that can be a sign that maybe oxygenation isn't quite right, and of course shortness of breath as well. So some real key signs that we want to explore heart function um, if anyone ever came to you with those sort of symptoms. So why is it important to test? Just a few quick stats. One in four adults suffer with some sort of cardiovascular issue, uh, which is massive. Um, it's the number one cause of death globally, just in front of cancer at the moment. So um, it's massive. Like we, you know, we're all affected by it in some form, whether it's our parents, our grandparents, or you know, a relative or neighbor, whatever. We all know someone very, very close in our proximity that's been. Um, you know, um, yeah, they're, they're exposed to some sort of cardiovascular issue. We do have an increased risk of uh, cardiovascular disease over the age of 50, um, but in all honesty, we're just not testing early enough. We're, there's, um, there's definitely a, a pattern of just waiting for things to happen and then we then test. Um, I've, I have a lot of clients in my case that, that definitely follow that pattern. And um, ideally, we actually wanna test years before so it's a chronic condition it doesn't just you know happen within a few weeks um or very very rarely does that happen uh, it, it's very insidious so it takes a long time for it to develop and the progression is generally pretty slow so if you catch it early that's the best thing but i would argue you know we should be testing in our 30s or you know 40s whenever you can uh, start to test I think it's really, really worth doing, um, rather than waiting till you're over 50 or you're in that higher risk category. Um, so at that point, maybe the plaque formation's already started or whatever it might be. So back onto that sort of aging and longevity side, um, you know, having a well-functioning heart is gonna keep you youthful, it's gonna keep you obviously alive for longer, um, and all of those things are obviously crucial to our health. Um, again, obviously to identify risk, prevent, that's uh, obviously one of our main jobs. And uh, generally the symptoms are silent. So it's, it's quite uncommon to find some sort of cardiovascular symptom. Um, but I would just say, uh, sometimes they might not be silent, but we ignore them. So definitely, uh, yeah, open up, open up to those sort of symptoms. You know, maybe we just get a little bit of chest pain that one time and then we pretend it didn't happen because we don't like to make a fuss. Um, definitely make a fuss and do some testing. That's what I would say. So let's explore some markers, in particular cholesterol. So it's 
we always start with cholesterol. You know, if we ever go to um, the doctor and we want to go and get some sort of blood test done, they'll always do a cholesterol, which is a great starting point, but it is very much just the tip of the iceberg. So knowing uh, knowing the overall amount is important, we absolutely then want to break it down and then keep breaking it down to understand it more and more. So it's exactly what we're going to do. We want to know what's happening underneath that high cholesterol level. We are going to explore HDL and LDL and triglycerides, or as I personally like to call it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we're also going to explore lipoproteins, which is basically the transport mechanism for cholesterol. So touching base on cholesterol, we actually make our own cholesterol and we make a uh, the majority of it. It's like 70 to 80 percent of cholesterol we make ourselves in the liver. That's how important it is to us. It's actually essential for our life and it provides loads of amazing functions. So we actually would die without cholesterol. So it's um, uh, really important for things like maintaining the integrity and fluidity of our cells. Um, it helps with the production of vitamin D. It's a precursor to steroid hormones and also bile acids. So it also helps with fat digestion. Um, funnily enough, it was actually given uh, a name when it was first, um, not invented, but found out. Essentially, it was given a name of cholesterine, uh, which is Greek for bile solids. So that's that's sort of how we knew it back in the day um, of its original function. And obviously now we found out it does all these other amazing things. Um, and we obviously do get some of it from food, but only around 20% do we get from animal products mainly. So meat and eggs generally. Um, so it is often vilified, but actually let's just zoom way out because it's so important to so many different aspects of health. And it's only once we start to understand, you know, how it gets used and the sort of vilification, if you like, of cholesterol that that it makes a little bit more sense. So to understand LDL and HDL a bit more, they are um, they're basically forms of lipoproteins. So lipoproteins are um, they're transport vehicles. Cholesterol, as we know, is a type of fat, and it needs to be transported. We know now we now know it does loads of amazing functions, so it has to then be transported to tissue to actually be utilized. And so to do that, because it's a type of fat, it needs to be in a car basically to move from A to B. And the way it does that is we combine it with a protein. So um, as the name suggests, it's a lipid literally attached to protein. Um, and these are basically vehicles. I like to use the analogy of um, a car on a motorway. So essentially, you know, to get from A to B. Um, we have to obviously get into a car that then travels us to tissue and then we, or <laughs> wherever we're going, and then that can be used. And we have different types of um, different types of vehicles, basically. So we have um, LDL, HDL, VLDL, LP little a, there's also IDL, which I haven't written down. Um, but these are all based on the density, which is essentially measuring the weight of this car. And um, the ratio that it's um measured is basically the lipids to protein ratio so the best way of looking at it is the more lipid versus protein so the more fattier the or the more fat that there is in the car the more buoyant that's going to be so it's less dense so if it can carry more fat i.e a low density lipoprotein um, that can obviously travel more cholesterol to an area but it'll also transport other fats like triglycerides as well um, anything then like a HDL is a high density, so it's actually uh, richer in protein than it is fat. So it's a much heavier car, if you like. Um, anyway, that's sort of the ins and outs of uh, lipoproteins. And it's when we get this abnormal lipoprotein sort of distribution, if you like, because we want to have it in a balance. And um, that's when we start to see issues occurring. So let's explore the individuals a bit more. So. HDL is high density lipoprotein. This is considered like the good one because it transports cholesterol from um, the bloodstream to the liver to then get excreted. So it helps with the clearance of cholesterol. So obviously for that reason, we all like HDL. It has got an association with um, being anti-atherogenic for that reason. So it won't accumulate, it won't sit in the blood and cause plaques or anything like that. Um, and for that reason, you know, having a higher HDL is considered a benefit um, for our heart health and has um, 
yeah, a lower risk of atherosclerosis. And likewise, a low L, um, sorry, a low HDL can be associated with a higher risk of atherosclerosis. So then LDL, as we all know it to be sort of the bad type of cholesterol, and that's mainly because it goes from the liver to tissue. So this is the one where we're carrying um, yeah, a lot more fat in our cars. We're carrying it then to tissue uh, to then get utilized. So it is therefore considered more of the bad cholesterol because it can be plaque forming, which we're going to discuss how it can form a plaque. Um, but generally, you know, elevated levels are associated with atherosclerosis. There is very much a correlation. Um, and it is also a type of fat which then can stay in the bloodstream. And we all know fat is very prone to oxidation. So then having, um, you know, any sort of oxidized LDL is certainly a key warning sign of an increased risk of, risk of atherosclerosis, very pro-atherogenic in high levels. Um, like, um, yeah, we do want to have good levels of LDL. I just really want to state that, you know, like we said, cholesterol is super, super important. So having good outgoing levels of LDL is super important, but then also we just don't want it to go out of hand and have too much. And it is this balance or this fine balance um, that we're going to explore. So triglycerides, another type of fat, mainly uh, the form of fat that we get from our diet. And this is, um, in my opinion, one of the really key risk markers for cardiovascular disease, also diabetes, um, specifically type 2, and uh, especially atherosclerosis as well. So it's mainly um, a key sort of uglier fat, <laughs> if you like, because it stores excess energy from our diet as a fat. And that's why we can see this increase in visceral fat um, deposition so we can have that build up of fat especially if it's in um sort of different areas we can have a lot of, like central weight gain as well um and this is what we can uh see with the raised triglycerides and it's very inflammatory it's a very inflammatory form of fat very much associated with a progression of atherosclerosis so if you have someone who has um you know high cholesterol maybe we're starting to see plaque formation uh, very commonly you're going to see they have raised triglycerides as well so these are all heavily interlinked um, often used as an independent marker for cardiovascular disease specifically so you'll see there's actually no um, low level of triglycerides as a bad thing we only want to have it in low levels uh, it's worth saying this is a blood test and therefore does need to be a fasted test um, because obviously if someone's just eaten some food they're likely going to have high levels of triglycerides but that would naturally reduce after a couple of hours or so so making sure that it's obviously a fasted sample is super important so then you're not going to get that influence from that specific meal they've just eaten okay let's jump into ldl and plaque formation so atherosclerosis it's um, a huge de disease of inflammation in, in its rife. Like we, we see it in so many cases of clients. It's, um, yeah, like I said, one of, the, one of the key current cardiovascular disease we're dealing with, especially in the UK. Um, and it's basically the narrowing of arteries is what it is. So, and it's due to this plaque formation that can happen. And we can eventually get an occlusion, which is like a full um, block in that, uh, artery and that can then obviously block blood flow that can absolutely drive a stroke it can drive a heart attack etc obviously worst case scenario um but it does include ldl cholesterol and this is where this we're going to demystify um so i do feel ldl has been given a bit of a bad a bit of a hard time um because of this particular reason so let's just talk about sort of the pathophysiology of it um so this is essentially the interior wall of a blood vessel is what we're looking at here. And it's lined with these endothelial cells that you can see. And these are in direct contact with our blood supply. So if there's any issues in our blood supply, our blood vessels will respond. And so it's a very active process. So if we have anything, let's say um, toxicity, and that can be from smoking, pollution, chronic alcohol use, et cetera. Um, it can also be in very uh, unique cases like a bacterial infection, maybe a virus infection, um, anything like that, that can disrupt it in the blood flow. That basically then 
allows the vascular system to respond. It'll then see that as obviously a huge issue. That's basically a threat to the, the vascular system. And so in response to whatever that particular trigger is, it will send out um, a signal. And it'll send out a signal to the white blood cells and also to recruit LDL um, to the site. And so essentially number one that you can see on the left hand side this is actually cholesterol although i appreciate it's been cut off at the edge um but cholesterol then comes and arrives to the scene because it's already floating around in our uh, blood and it also is there to support with things like the integrity of our blood um our off cell membranes so straight away we're going to get a surge of cholesterol coming to the area we then also get an influx of uh, immune cells and these um immune cells specifically monocytes and T lymphocytes start to also enter into the bloodstream, um, into the, sorry, into the cell wall. We then also get a macrophage, which is um, kind of like this Pac-Man type immune cell. Um, and that occupies the tissue. It engulfs all, uh, all of these things up. So it will take on the immune cells, it'll take on the cholesterol, and it essentially becomes quite a fatty immune cell. And it kind of um, has this foamy appearance and it becomes what we call a foam cell. Um, and a foam cell is now basically a very, very vulnerable fatty cell is essentially what it is. And so it's extremely prone now to becoming oxidized, um, if there's ongoing inflammation. So uh, sort of laden fat, if you like, in the foam cell becomes very sticky and it can, they start to combine and it will stick to the blood vessel wall. And we start to see this accumulation of fat occurring now. So if this process continues, um, so a continuation of this tox toxin exposure, let's say, we then uh, get this whole process that then sort of starts to um, to start to cycle. We then get more cholesterol to the area, more immune response, and eventually more foam cell um, production, and then we get more and more of this uh, accumulation, and eventually we start to get um, blood vessel damage. We also then get um, plaque formation, essentially, and this is the very start of cardiovascular disease. Um, so this narrowing of the blood vessels that we can see on this image um, is the reduction then in blood flow. So obviously consider, obviously we have blood vessels and obviously that starts to occlude. We then start to have basically a bulge literally in that blood vessel. Um, that reduces things like blood flow, reduces then uh, our oxygenation, which comes through our blood flow. It reduces then the nutrients that are also supplied through our blood flow. Um, and that can lead to loads of different symptoms, high blood pressure, it can lead to then chest pains, it can lead to palpitations, all of those common symptoms we know um, coincide with cardiovascular disease. And then, like I said, if it then becomes too large, if the tissue damage continues and continues, we can then actually end up with a, a full on obstruction. Um, and that's where we can then see, you know, uh, like a heart attack or a stroke occurring. So it's um, an incredibly impressive process. Um, and it's all to do with tissue injury. And actually the response to that is the higher level of cholesterol, the higher level of white blood cell and immune response happening. So when we're faced with that client who has got a high cholesterol, um, I actually want to be like zooming out and considering, okay, why, where is it, where is the tissue damage? What's driving this endothelial dysfunction basically? Um, that absolutely has to be the question we should be asking. So Endothelial dysfunction is exactly what we've just been describing. So it is that thin membrane lines the inside of the blood vessels um, and it controls our vascular relaxation and contraction. So damage to the endothelial lining is, um, is the massive issue that we should be targeting. Uh, and that's essentially what we're trying to explore as well. So we want to know if someone has high cholesterol. Okay, why do they have high cholesterol? Is it because of inflammation, is it to do with their blood glucose, is it to do with um, maybe testosterone, et cetera. This is the whole point of seeing this test as a whole um, comprehensive overview. So endothelial dysfunction will happen from oxidative stress. And that obviously can come in lots of different guises. So whether it is from a high intake of um, alcohol, maybe it's a high intake of Smoking, you know, there's a huge causation of smoking and damaging blood vessels. We know that this is exactly um, what, what we're talking about here. So anything like that, that can absolutely drive damage to the endothelial lining. And it is, like I said, this consistency of that, that will then um, eventually lead to this reduction in things like nitric oxide, which work on our blood flow 
um, then obviously a lack of nutrients, a lack of oxygenation, and that all in itself will create more oxidative stress, more damage, and it becomes a vicious cycle. So we absolutely, definitely something we want to get on top of, and then obviously try and um, break the cycle as much as possible. I just wanted to share a couple of articles that personally I find really interesting, so hopefully uh, they're interesting to you too. But they, um, the Lancet one specifically, I thought was quite interesting because it's a bit, a little, it's a bit, a bit hard, a bit, a bit sad actually to read. But um, I recommend reading it anyway. Um, but it's a study working on um, the impact of air pollution. Uh, and heart and uh, an increase in things like heart uh, events like atherosclerosis or heart attack and uh, there has there is an increased risk from walking they basically took two sets of people so volunteers who have heart disease in some capacity um, and then also another group of people who um, you also have heart disease in some capacity and they sent one of them one group to do a two-hour walk in uh, I think it's like Oxford Street in London and then the other one to do a, a two-hour walk in a park and actually even though you know we talk about doing exercise and how beneficial that is uh, to our heart health um, actually the environment we're doing that walk in could actually be detrimental to our heart health and this is kind of what this study is explaining and that's the group that then did the walk in London and Oxford Street um, actually had an increase in their uh, cardiovascular um, health, uh, which, which is terrible. They, yeah, they had an increased risk in atherosclerosis, uh, plaques, bigger plaque buildup, um, myocardial infarctions, all sorts of things. Uh, and the people in the park didn't. So uh, definitely something to consider if we're going for a walk. Definitely check where you're gonna go for a walk especially if you've got a, a current heart condition going on. So we definitely want to be breathing in a lot more oxygenation and reducing that sort of pollution impact that could uh, be worsening our cardiovascular symptoms. So really interesting. Um, and also, I don't, you might have already come across it, the Cantos study, uh, which is sort of like a real breakthrough study of um, realizing that, you know, cholesterol is important, but actually it's the environment that cholesterol is living in um, that's the most important. So having an insight into inflammation, inflammatory responses, et cetera, is actually the, the real massive uh, impact on whether we're going to have any sort of cardiovascular event or not. So I fully recommend giving those both a read. Um, so moving on to cholesterol ratios, um, we measure two, and these are actually a really great tool for risk assessment. Uh, we look at the triglyceride to HDL ratio and then also the total cholesterol to H uh, HDL. Um, again, we're looking at basically the more inflammatory versus anti-inflammatory aspects of cholesterol um, or just um, fats in the blood, basically. So it's shown to be actually a better predictor of cardiovascular disease than actually just looking at cholesterol. So the ratios really do matter, um, especially the triglyceride to HDL. Um, that's been associated with things like metabolic and cardiovascular risk if the ratio is high that is obviously we want it to be low i.e triglyceride versus hdl is much lower um so yeah we're sort of measuring that level of protection and the total uh, total cholesterol versus hdl is more of a predictor of um uh yeah coronary heart disease it's literally there um but yeah just in terms of the uh, actual ratio for that one specifically, um, it reflects the formation of coronary plaques. So if the ratio is above six, um, you'll, it roughly correlates to 66% increased risk of um, yeah, plaque formation, basically. So really, really important to assess the ratio. Okay, moving on to apolipoproteins. So these are really insightful, possibly more insightful than looking at LDL. Uh, I'd argue it is a lot more insightful than looking at LDL itself. So this is when our science has really moved on to looking into apolipoproteins and inflammatory markers when it comes to cardiovascular um, risk. So generally the definition, you know, they're surface proteins is what they are. And they kind of like wrap around lipoproteins, they're kind of like a little jacket. And we have two specific ones. We've got APOA1, we've also got APOB. And they are um, correlating with um, HDL and then 
the other atherogenic ones. So APOA1 is the structural component for HDL and it supports the clearance essentially. So we want to have you know, a really good amount of APOA1, it's shown to be protective, having higher levels is associated with a decreased risk of atherosclerosis. Um, it's also been shown to stimulate nitric oxide, uh, which we know is pre very preventative for vascular function. Um, but then also having a decreased level, therefore, um, associated with a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, there are certain uh, dietary influences on our apolipoproteins. So these are modifiable. And we are uh, looking at things like diets rich in inflammatory foods, of course. So diets rich in uh, trans fats. Uh, if someone has a lot, um, a lot of toxicity going on, maybe they smoke. Certain medications as well have also been shown to increase, uh, sorry, decrease apolipoproteins. So definitely very easily influenced by what we're doing. We then have ApoB, which is the main component for, or structural component, sorry, uh, for atherogenic lipoproteins. So this does include LDL, but it also includes the other atherogenic ones like LP little a as well. Um, this is um, now turning out to be a much stronger indicator for um, atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease. Um, this is, yeah, this is definitely a, a certain key marker in particular. And it's essentially, just to go back to the car analogy, so lipoproteins are the cars on the road, Apo, um, apo lipoproteins um, are telling us how many there are on the road essentially so the more cars we have on the road the riskier it's going to be to go out there because we might end up in a crash basically is the way to kind of consider this situation so we want to have um again we want to have some because you know it's doing its job it's you know sending cholesterol out to the right places um obviously having too much actually then tells us there's a lot more there, i.e. why is there a lot more there? Why are we sending out more cars of uh, cholesterol to an area? So again, we're always going to come back to what's driving this endothelial dysfunction, basically, that's underlying this. So a high level, again, increase with, um, increased risk, sorry, of atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease. It's basically telling us that, you know, there's some, in, some sort of inflammatory response happening, our body's responding to that. And therefore diets rich in inflammatory foods are also gonna drive this. So things like, um, sorry, trans fats um, have definitely been shown to increase levels. The ratio of ApoB to ApoA1, naturally, you know, we want that to be nice and low. We wanna have less ApoAB to ApoA1, essentially. Um, but again, you know, we do still want to have a little bit of a balance. Um, and having um, a much higher ratio has been associated with metabolic syndrome and diabetes in particular. Um, but yeah, so really key section. I would also point out this LP little a, um, which is another type of lipoprotein. It's a genetically determined marker, basically. So we obviously can't really modify it as such, uh, certainly not through diet and lifestyle, though some supplementation has been shown to be quite effective. Um, but LP little a, it carries an atherogenic risk. So not the nicest thing to see high on a report like this. Um, and it promotes inflammation and oxidative stress um, once it's entered the blood vessel wall. So if this is traveling around in its APOB car, basically, um, you know, and then we have some sort of tissue damage and that can then get obviously taken to the site of injury. Um, it locks the dyes, the fats very, very quickly and easily. So we definitely want to have lower levels where we can. Um, we don't want to oxidize that LDL. And it yeah, can eventually drive plaque formation basically. So in terms of lowering LP little A, like I said, diet and lifestyle don't tend to really have an impact, sadly. Um, but certain supplements have been shown to impact. So things like uh, carnitine shown to be very effective, CoQ10, uh, and also red yeast rice as well. So um, you know, if this does come up higher, I'd consider those sorts of things. So we're gonna park lipids and we're gonna now move on to cardiometabolic markers. So uh, we're targeting HSCRP, homocysteine, insulin here. So very much inflammatory markers. And this is synonymous with any sort of cardio disease. Um, we absolutely want to identify, is there inflammation? Like I said, it's um, 
Cholesterol is all well and good, but want to know the environment it's in. And this is where we get to understand that environment. So HSDRP, which is an acute phase response, so triggered by interleukin, uh, 6, 1B, um, uh, tumor necrosis factor. So it's essentially a more sensitive version than CRP. So we all know about C-reactive protein that we can get. Um, this is basically the earlier stages of that. So it's the more like trace mineral version, if you like. And it's telling us if there's low lying inflammation. And that's absolutely what we want to find out. It can then correlate, it, well, it does correlate heavily with um, atherosclerosis, uh, obesity, type 2 diabetes, et cetera. Um, but, you know, this is sort of that undercurrent that we always find with any sort of cardiovascular disease. So really important to check where someone's inflammatory markers are. Um, some key aspects would be smoking again, um, including secondhand smoke will also drive um, a HSDRP. So always worth um, testing. You obviously again want this to be as low as possible. So having obviously low levels of inflammation is the goal. Um, the second it starts to creep up, you know that's a starting point as well. So then that will only become more inflammatory um, into CRP later on. So we want to really get on top of that as much as we can. Um, it can be reduced, which is obviously um, a great thing to know. So we can reduce our inflammatory markers, as we know. It's all the typical things we know about. So removing the inflammatory um, toxins in the first place and promoting more anti-inflammatory support like um, extra virgin olive oil, omega-3 rich foods or supplementation. Exercise has also been shown to reduce HSCRP. And I've actually put a link at the bottom here, which is, um, it's basically to a, a, a New England Journal of Medicine study, which con basically concluded that CRP outperforms LDL cholesterol as a predictor for cardiovascular disease. So just thought I'd share that as well. Okay, moving on to homocysteine and insulin. So it's always worth looking at homocysteine. It is known mainly for its role in methylation and it can also be an indicator of cardiovascular risk. So it does have um, a role it plays in vascular function. So it can be pro-thrombotic uh, um, and decreased availability of nitric oxide. So we can see this um, higher with people who maybe are more at risk for blood clots, uh, stroke, obviously atherosclerosis, um, those sorts of things. And it basically increases um, platelet aggregation. So it makes things a bit stickier. Um, yeah, so very, very uh, key marker. Obviously, if it's raised, really want to consider those key methylation nutrients, like our B vitamin status, essentially. So um, increasing things like folate, maybe consider their B12, B6, etc. cetera. Um, and then, you know, other things that will drive it, typically um, smoking, alcohol, anything that's particularly stressful, essentially, to the system. So um, those are certainly be your, your key areas uh, to start with. I would also then look at it alongside things like insulin. So uh, as we all know, it's a, it's a key hormone secreted by the pancreas in response to our blood glucose. We measure it fasted um, to gain an insight into insulin resistance and metabolic um, sort of dysfunction, essentially. We want it to be low. We want low fasting insulin levels as a good sign of metabolic health. Obviously, if we're waking up and our insulin is already quite high, um, you're perhaps dealing with someone with um, insulin resistance or certainly a lack of insulin sensitivity, um, which can obviously drive a higher blood glucose. Um, you'd very often find if someone's edging towards um, diabetes or prediabetes, um, that's type two, um, you'll often find having a raised insulin will be the first marker to, to tell you it's edging that way rather than a higher glucose if that makes sense um but yeah so we can uh, then start to understand okay we need to prioritize someone's insulin sensitivity um there is huge impact of having high insulin obviously then uh, moving on to type 2 diabetes then moving on to obesity and cardiovascular disease these are all synonymous so um definitely a, a really really key marker and essentially, anything that's then going to drive blood glucose to be higher, we're going to see higher levels of inflammation. We know glucose traveling around the blood is very, very inflammatory at high levels. Um, and then if, you know, if insulin is not able to respond to that, we're, we're pretty much set up to then oxidize um, fat that can also be circulating. And this is where we start to see um, that blood vessel damage start to happen. So really key section. 
And the very last section of the report is looking into hormones. So we look into testosterone and we also look into sex hormone binding globulin. And generally, you know, we know testosterone does amazing things um, anabolically. So it helps like build muscles. It, it's amazing for our bone density. And it does also have uh, some responsibilities also for our heart health. And we look at it alongside sex hormone binding globulin specifically, um, because that can impact obviously our testosterone or how it appears our testosterone um, to be in terms of the bioavailability. So testosterone is, you know, generally, you know, we see it as sort of the, the male hormone um, and it does have a huge impact specifically on men and their risk of cardiovascular health. Um, I haven't come across the research of this with women, um, but certainly uh, it's, it's quite prevalent with um, male cohorts in particular. So there are key areas that testosterone works on in terms of managing our insulin sensitivity. Um, it can also then work on um, atherosclerosis for that reason as well. Um, but it can then be impacted by things like obesity, obviously high stress load. Um, someone's diet's gonna play a huge role if they're on a low fat diet. It might just not have the precursors there to then actually produce much testosterone. Obviously consider someone's vitamin D as well as a precursor. Um, but generally, it's been shown to regulate nitric oxide, so it can influence vasodilation, endothelial function, essentially blood flow. Um, so really, really important for things like our heart health. I've actually put down a few research articles at the bottom, which I think are really fascinating to read, um, very much giving an insight into the fact that the, there are studies there that men who have higher levels of testosterone um, actually have lower risk of atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. So there is some level of um, cardioprotective characteristic from testosterone. Um, and, you know, again, naturally it's going to decline with age, as do most things. Um, but, you know, we can still keep our testosterone nice and healthy by working on things like our stress load, our, uh, our diet, making sure that it is rich in essential fats, managing our vitamin D levels. Um, also consider people's lifestyle choices like uh, medications, alcohol naturally depletes testosterone production. Uh, also marijuana has been shown to reduce levels. So those sorts of lifestyle things certainly want to get on top of. Um, and also the HPT axis, so the hypothalamic pituitary testes axis, um, that can also be suppressed with uh, chronic conditions like metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, etc. So, yeah, I definitely give these studies a read as well. It's very, very, very fascinating, especially if you're working with men and, and their heart health. Um, so then it's really worth looking at testosterone alongside sex hormone binding globulin. So this is a protein, it's produced mainly in the liver and it transports our sex hormones as the name suggests. So um, in this case, we look at it alongside testosterone for the reasons that we've just explored for heart health. And levels of SHBG are influenced by our nutrition, also our metabolism, our hormone health our liver health. Um, so all of those things, it is heavily regulated literally by, you know, what we're doing. But high levels um, will basically mean that it's binding to more testosterone in this case. So it can mean that there are less bioavailable hormones. So it basically transports hormones to tissue and then they can be utilized. But if there's more levels of sex hormone binding globulin going around our system, that's just binding more to hormones that then we can't really use yet. So it can actually cause symptoms of hormone deficiencies, even though we might not actually be deficient in that hormone, it might actually be more of an issue with sex hormone binding globulin. So so um, this is why it's always worth looking at them together. And obviously we can then um, we could then experience symptoms like testosterone insufficiency, um, which then we could target through sex hormone binding globulin as well. So considerations of um, having higher levels would be if someone has any issues with their liver. So obviously it's made from the liver. So naturally anything that impacts the liver will impact sex hormone binding globulin levels, um, normally releasing higher levels. Certain medications like the oral contraceptive pill has also been shown to increase levels. Um, cigarettes, so again, smoking. Uh, diets low in protein, uh, you know, it is, a, it is a type of protein, so um, making sure we are having a, a decent amount going in. Um, our stress load massively is gonna impact pretty much everything. Alcohol and then obviously age. So 
that it's just worth noting those secretions of sex hormone binding globulin is suppressed by insulin as well, or can be suppressed by insulin. So also looking this alongside insulin is really, really helpful. Um, so we often find lower levels with insulin resistance. So if someone's got high insulin, we commonly find this to be low. Um, and that can also be another further insight into potential metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, and obviously therefore a risk of cardiovascular disease. So to summarize, putting it all together, which is exactly what uh, this test is doing. Um, we're looking at obviously cholesterol and it's very much, I wanna see it as that is the top of the iceberg, the top of the charts. And then we work all the way down to things going on underneath. Um, so that's kind of how it's represented here. Um, certainly the way I would read it as well. You know, it's all about the environment that we've created. Obviously diet and lifestyle play a humongous role. I think there's some sort of terrifying statistic out there that I heard actually this morning, um, which is like 90% of cardiovascular disease um, can easily be um, avoided uh, just through changing our diet and lifestyle. 90% and it's the global leading cause of death. So we have a lot of work to do in terms of um, you know, educating our clients, you know, getting diet back on track. Uh, a lot of this has to do with metabolic um, disorders. So, you know, metabolically, we're, a lot of us are not, not particularly well off metabolically. Um, and, you know, that is generally the way the modern world's going at the moment. We're living such stressful lives. We're eating a lot of convenience foods. We're not really sleeping properly. We barely hydrate, etc. So we have a lot of control in how we can bring a lot of these markers back into place, um, which is the best thing to know. Um, but obviously, we don't know until we test. So uh, personally, I think, especially out of majority of testing opportunities, when you've got a cardiovascular client, you have to. Uh, that, that's truly the way I see it. Um, just because you're not going to know unless you have those values in front of you. It's also then a really good monitoring tool to then see the progress they've made, which everyone then feels better when they see, a, you know, their triglycerides are much lower. That's always a nice moment. So um, that's essentially the cardio check in itself. Um, and every area speaks to each other. So, you know, working on, let's just say someone has a raised inflammatory marker, you're going to just naturally see uh, benefits everywhere else by working on that one area. So I wouldn't be too alarmed if everything comes up really high on these tests. If you have that sort of a client, obviously big, big warning sign, probably edging towards cardiovascular disease, um, but you can do a heck of a lot with it. So it's, um, yeah, it's quite an empowering test to have in front of you when you get the results. I do want to touch on um, what we can do about it because there's loads. There is loads. Obviously, there are some areas we can't. We have these two very distinct categories, non-modifiable risk and modifiable. So the non-modifiable, you know, we can't do anything about aging. We're just all going to age. Can't do anything about gender. Can't do anything about genetics, etc. But what we can do is manage things like our diet, our lifestyle, you know, the environment we choose to live in, all of those things that are going to have an impact we, we can control. Um, I've just jotted down sort of the, you know, the generics that are um, definitely worth saying. So, you know, diet in particular, we want to keep it anti-inflammatory. We want to make it as whole foods, as colourful, nutrient rich as possible. Um, you know, we want to provide all of those amazing nutrients that our body needs to function well. We know all of the amazing like heart healthy nutrients. So the more colourful, the better, you know, those really deep red, like beetroots, things like tomatoes are amazing for our heart health, all sorts of fruits and vegetables that are different colours. Um, this is very much like a rainbow diet, I would say. Um, obviously lots of uh, anti-inflammatory foods like omega-3, um, fiber support to actually help with also clearance of toxicity, um, go around our system as well in the gut. Also then can also bind to things like LDL cholesterol to help with clearance as well. So uh, fiber, I'd say, is massively important. Um, and generally, just reducing as much processed gunk, basically, we can out of our diets, whether that comes in the form of packeted items, sugary food, sugary drinks, trans fats, anything like that. Um, we just don't need it. It's going to drive inflammatory uh, markers. It can then damage our blood vessel linings, etc. So if we're, you know, in the mode of wanting to promote heart health, we, we, it's a no-brainer. We have to get rid of these sorts of foods. Um, and lifestyle plays huge, huge impacts here. So um, stress, I appreciate is very difficult to manage for for most people, um, but it, we have to put some level of management in place where we can, whether that's through breath work, um, through journaling, if someone can meditate, 
great. Uh, those sorts of things, you know, maybe you do an adrenal stress profile to see how stressed someone actually is on a daily basis. You know, just gaining that extra knowledge or putting some mechanisms in place to deal with stress um, can, yeah, can make a, the world of difference. Naturally want to, um, you know, work on someone's metabolic health, whether you work on uh, fasting, uh, there's huge amounts of research with fasting to benefit things like our, um, our lipid levels, our inflammatory levels, you know, if we're constantly snacking, we're constantly eating, our body can't work on repair. So um, yeah, we definitely want to make sure there's a good fasting period in place. We'll also work on our metabolic health at the same time. Um, exercise, you know, goes without saying, it works on um, increasing blood flow, which we definitely want to do, want to support that circulatory system. Exercise is brilliant for that. We literally have, you know, cardiovascular, cardio exercises, as the name suggests, supports our heart health. Um, so yeah, definitely some movement, even if it's just like 30 minutes of walking. Um, but I'd say variety is key. So uh, especially for aging, um, you know, we want to work on strength as well. Uh, building that uh, muscle to some extent as well to actually utilize the glucose if someone has got um, any insulin resistance. Those sorts of things are going to be super, super helpful. Hydration, again, has a blood flow. Um, oh, it helps with everything, really. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like it goes without saying. Uh, good quality sleep, absolutely crucial. That's why we manage uh, through sleep and we repair any damage. Uh, so really important to just get a good sleep, but then also it's how we regulate our hormones, especially adrenaline, angiotensin 2, bradykinin, all of those things that then really work on vasodilation, vasocontraction, um, and essentially stress, like it will it'll help us deal with stress better if we're sleeping better. So definitely sleep. 100% um, we want to identify what the toxic load is. Obviously, that's going to be completely unique to each individual. So this is where we, as clin uh, clinicians, we want to dig in deep, you know, do they smoke? Do they drink a lot of alcohol? Do they um, have, do they, I don't know, use a lot of chemicals in their house? Are they constantly burning incense sticks or, I don't know, something like that? That um, they're constantly taking in some level of toxicity. If they've got cardiovascular disease, they've got some um, toxicity going on somewhere and we need to find what that is or it could be blood glucose related. So definitely want to explore. Maybe they keep walking down the streets of London for two hours, who knows. Um, liver support, naturally, you know, a lot of these um, markers uh, are made from the liver. So we really need a good functioning liver. Um, so again, this is where alcohol is massive. Um, if, that, if that's, you know, impacting your liver, putting pressure on the liver, everything else is gonna, sadly not not be working quite as well so i'd say sweating is going to be really nice here if someone's in a fight and flight mode maybe don't sweat so much um but generally you know supporting detoxification is going to be key um obviously again managing glucose etc i would say reading labels is going to be a really nice tool for clients to be able to do um, and gives them a bit of a sense of empowerment of choosing what they put in their body also just knowing what they're putting in their body um, because there are a lot of hidden ingredients and we you know it's it's definitely no one's fault for for not recognizing that um, but it just starting to understand you know what is in your granola in the morning or what's in your porridge if you're not making it um, you know definitely read what's what's in it in the first place and if there's any like syrups and all of that stuff like especially if it's um yeah high glucose um syrup or if there's like brown brown rice syrup those sorts of things they're just another word for sugar so you probably want to put that to the side maybe go for some fruit or berries or something instead um and then the very last point i thought was just really interesting i've come out i should have put the links i might email them to you all um but there's loads of research about how community being involved in a community being involved in some sort of volunteer program as well has actually been shown to decrease cardiovascular events happening um which i thought was a really nice takeaway point like actually just getting involved with a group of people to do something um can actually work wonders for loads of different areas of health. Um, you know, there's an argument that you're moving more when you're in a like a community-based activity, whether it's I don't know, a walking group or I don't know, some sort of volunteer program, you're naturally moving a bit more, so you're not so sedentary. You're also then with a group of people, so um, mental well-being tends to improve as well, stress then starts to decline. You're also then giving something back to the community, and that's always a really good feeling, uh, releases those endorphins, relaxes everything. So um, yeah, there's some really fascinating stuff out there that we could be doing that's also a little bit different, something nice to recommend, especially if you've got a retired client and they you know, want to do something good with their time. Um, 
yeah so anyway some key lifestyle points and things there so uh i've just popped this here let me just quickly check the time okay we've got a few minutes so we're okay um but yeah just a quick you know just things to avoid obviously if someone has an acute infection uh, that's naturally going to drive inflammatory markers so avoid in those cases wait till the infection's gone or treat the infection whatever you're doing and then probably give it a good couple of weeks and then do the test um i would avoid exercising 24 hours before um obviously like stretching and stuff's fine but like anything that's gonna actually raise a heart rate probably reduce the exercise uh yeah a day beforehand just in case that drives inflammatory markers um it does require a 12 hour fast um and avoiding uh nac so it is known to interfere with lipid analysis so that would be the nutrients to avoid taking uh if they are um but otherwise you're pretty good to go just needs a blood test so that is the end of today's session i'm literally bang on time i'm very impressed i appreciate it's one o'clock so um i i don't know if anyone has time for questions i can i'm happy to stay on a little bit longer and answer a few questions if there are any um but otherwise we've got you know loads of amazing events coming up like this so hopefully if you enjoyed it um you can find more at our education events link which i've listed here or you know if you've just got a question you want to ask drop us an email. We absolutely love getting your questions. So definitely feel free to, to contact us as much as you need to. And I, I'm, I'm going to do it. If anyone, you, there's quite a few still here. So that's great. Let's just go for some questions. I can see we have a few. Um, I'll ask, I'll just do a couple and then you can all just drop out when you're ready. Um, a few asking if it's recorded, it is recorded. So we will send you the recording either later today or tomorrow. So then you can rewatch if you need to. Um, let me find. Uh, uh, one school thought is that high cholesterol. This is Nikki Brown. Hi, Nikki. Uh, one school thought is that high cholesterol as you get older is more beneficial in terms of cholesterol long, uh, in terms of longevity. Uh, do you take age into account with this test? um in terms of the reference range do we take age it's just an adult reference range um but yeah i mean understandably a higher cholesterol like we've just i guess discovered it's not necessarily a bad thing so it doesn't necessarily mean there's an issue i would always then want to check that there is inflammation because then if there is that's then the issue or that then puts cholesterol at risk so that's where we see the issue with longevity um well not longevity um but cardiovascular disease cardiovascular risk so i there isn't like an age limit for this test obviously if someone's happy to do a blood test you can obviously then do it but generally it is going to be sort of the older population um but i'd honestly say from 30 plus i would want to start thinking about testing these sorts of markers um i hope that answers your question nikki um with insulin should it be measured fasting uh yeah absolutely should be measured fasting yeah so a 12-hour fast is typically what we'd recommend um okay good question deb what time frames are we talking let's say someone tests in january the results are borderline uh so about retesting when would you retest after you've put in some interventions um in all honesty i would three months is what i would that's what i would say but you can obviously do longer i probably wouldn't do less than three months um because it takes time for things to decrease and also it takes time to make changes to then see a difference so depending on the client you've got if they're like gung-ho i'd say three months as a minimum um but yeah i'd say around that time frame if someone's a, if people are a bit slower to, to you know put changes in place then obviously do a bit longer um you probably wouldn't expect to see such a big difference in that time frame um yeah, let's just say three to six months but personally around a three month mark especially if markers are really high i'd want to check that pretty quickly uh... oh emma that's a big question i'm gonna email you back sorry i just feel like uh, it might be a bit of a too big a question at the moment so i will email you emma um in some tests there are no non-hdl levels indicated 
Uh, Non-HDL tend to just be the other forms of uh, um, lipoproteins. So you, you always want the breakdown is what I would say. Um, just knowing non-HDL, like you say, it's not, it's not enough information. Um, so yeah, I would always want the breakdown for sure. Um, which goes for saying if anyone just goes to the NHS to get their cholesterol checks, I would I would want to ask for the breakdown as well. Um, if patients taking statins, Catherine, great question. Uh, how does this affect test results? Uh, other medications could affect test results. Okay, so great question. Um, obviously, loads of people are going to take meds, especially if you're going to think about cardiovascular stuff. Um, it's absolutely fine to do this test if people are taking um, statins, you know, beta blockers, whatever it is. Um, it's absolutely fine. Um, if anything, it's going to be a good insight to see if it's doing enough. Um, because for quite a few people, they can be on statins and the cholesterol is still really high, um, which again, maybe we need to target the reason underneath, which is maybe there's tissue damage, inflammation, that will then help to bring the cholesterol down. So um, it's a great monitoring tool for people who are on medications, especially if then they want to come off medications. Um, you would then have to test whilst they're on to see um, you know, if it's actually being effective enough. Um, Whilst then you're doing dietary changes, it's also really great to monitor that because obviously you don't want to then send things too low. So then it's a great tool in that respect to then be able to go back to a doctor and say, look, my cholesterol is now at four or four and a half, whatever. Um, yeah, can I reduce my statins or can I come off statins or whatever? So it's a nice tool to be able to do alongside coming off medications. So absolutely fine to do this test. And if anything, very, very insightful. Um, hope that answers your question. Um, someone says, in a patient with high LP little a, high HSCRP, what supplements would you recommend? Um, so high, um, LP little a specifically, um, you're looking at things like carnitine, CoQ10, um, red, uh, red yeast rice. Um, those are sort of the three key ones that have been the most researched to reduce levels. Uh, you're going to struggle with diet and lifestyle for LP little a, so supplementation tends to be the direct route. Um, HSCRP, anti-inflammatory support. So um, new, supplement wise, sorry, is your question. So things like, yeah, uh, omega-3, I'd consider vitamin D as well. Maybe turmeric could be quite nice. Um, even things like ginger could be quite nice as well. So those sorts of things could be worth considering taking. Um, definitely, obviously, along, alongside lifestyle and dietary stuff. Um, uh, some, uh, Julie says, what's the role of sugar in atherosclerosis? So um, essentially what we're talking about was it's, very, it's an inflammatory molecule. Obviously, if someone's just having like, one chocolate bar in a while that's very much a different story but we're talking about the consistency of a, a high sugar diet um and it obviously becomes very inflammatory um that plays havoc on our um on our insulin levels it wreaks havoc on our blood glucose levels it's very difficult to manage we end up in that whole sort of roller coaster cycle that drives things like obviously a higher blood glucose then we've got an inflammatory molecule cycling in the blood but then also um I've lost my train of thought. Yeah, we'll just can continue on that thought. So yeah, sorry, it will just cycle around the blood uh, and it can then, obviously, it can attach to things and we can let, um, basically get these aged, um, advanced aged glycoproteins, uh, which then become very, very inflammatory and that can all become very adhesive. It can uh, attach to things like LDL and the cholesterol, um, LDL and the cholesterol, um, LDL in the blood, um, or essentially it can attach to things like our blood vessel lining, uh, depending on what else is going on. But regardless, it's the inflammatory aspect of it. Um, so we, we really want to manage blood glucose as much as possible, um, especially if we've got a high glucose intake on a consistent basis. A one-off, like I said, different story. Um, but yeah. Um, how long would you avoid NAC before doing the test, Rosie? Um, I would say a week, just to be extra cautious. Uh, you're probably fine at like, to be honest, like two to four days, but I would just say a week to be extra cautious. You know, you don't want to risk any like, um, any, any possible interference in that way. So I'd just say a week just to, you know, account for everyone's individual clearance, etc. Um, 
uh, Helen, what were the supplements you mentioned that helped little uh, LP little A? Um, so that was carnitine, CoQ10, and uh, red yeast rice. Um, I'll just, oh, it's 10 past. I'll just answer two more. Um, is LDL broken down and measured or is it a calculation, Lisa? Um, yeah, I'm not sure what you mean, actually. I'm not sure what you mean, Lisa. I'm sorry. Um, but it is, I mean, you get a total measure of LDL and then we look into how much LDL there is, which is looking at the APOB. I hope that makes sense. Um, please ask me again if um, that isn't the answer to your question. Um, oh, Taran, I think that's how I'm saying your name. Sorry if that's wrong. Uh, NH. SGP, we have no access to apolipoproteins, look like we're missing a lot of preatherosclerotic population. Yeah, amazing. Maybe you can get it on the NHS. That would be so cool. Um, 100%. Um, it's actually quite interesting that um, it's about 50% of people who have a heart attack don't have raised LDL levels. So, um, yeah, I do think there is quite a key area that we're not exploring in enough detail um but yes fight for it to be on the nhs that would be amazing um okay i think i'm gonna leave it there i, I'm a, I appreciate i've taken up so much of your time so uh there are a few questions still here which i will 100 percent get back to you on um, I won't leave a question unanswered, I promise. I'll drop you all an email if you've, if you've asked anything. Otherwise, you will receive the recording. If you've already got the slides, if not, we'll send you the slides again. And I, um, I'll leave you with that. So enjoy the rest of your Wednesday and thanks again.